Hello. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here and share this with uh, share this with everybody. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll dive into a presentation in a moment, but just to, to start, like, um, if anybody has any questions throughout, feel free to jump in. Um, just kind of curious from folks in the room um, if people are uh, mainly like where people are building. Are they building on Ethereum, Tezos? Like, what are what, do people have experience with this sort of stuff, or is this all new? I'm um, just kind of curious what people's general familiarity is with um, kind of crypto and blockchain and smart contracts. I'll chime in. Um, I've minted mainly on Tezos and um, minted recently on Ethereum, but with a partner. Um, so I didn't actually do the minting over there. So pretty, you know, generally uh, know about smart contracts, but I'm sure I will be very enlightened by, by this talk. Thank you for being here. Sure, of course. Sounds great. Hi, uh, Isaac. Um, I've been, I've minted my second collection on Manifold after uh, I did my first on uh, OpenSea, which was like uh, almost a year and a half ago. So uh, Manifold still didn't have the possibility for artists to mint easily. So I, I waited <laughs> for them to integrate it to Foundation so I could... Um, uh, minted there uh, and yeah I've been using Manifold ever since they uh, they opened it to artists and I've been really happy with that so um, nice very cool yeah. that's my my experience and, and uh, one of the things I I really like is that you can you can basically uh, change your stuff <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's something I've been exploring yeah and um, so, yeah, mostly ETH. So, cool. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. All right. I will let me share this whole window. Let me know. Everybody can see this Google Slides. Yes. Great. Um, so, uh, very excited to be here and talk to you about smart contracts. Um, I'm a, a programmer and engineer by trade, um, but I love like collaborating with artists and helping them explore new mediums and um, play around with uh, play around with what's possible. Um, so, if I were to sum up like why smart contracts are important in like one sentence, to me, it's like um, it, it allows you to really challenge uh, what people's um, assumptions are around like what an NFT is and, and what it can be. Um, the existing sites and marketplaces, whether it's OpenSea or even Manifold, which allows for customizability, um, they all kind of have this same notion of like what an NFT is, which is usually like it has some link to somewhere that has a content. Maybe it has some uh, maybe it has some data on chain. Maybe it has some data off chain, maybe in a centralized database, maybe in a decentralized database. But it always like has an owner and it always has like a price. It can always be traded. Um, but what I really want to uh, convey is that if you learn what you can do with smart contracts and start messing around with it on one level lower, you can kind of change what people think of like what an NFT is and what it can be and how you interact with it. Um, and so that's what I'll get to once I get through some uh, basics. Uh, but just going into it, just think like uh, smart contracts allow you to take what people think an NFT is um, and really kind of turn it on its head and, and make it and make it your own and uh, with with limitless creativity. So I'll go over like some basics about what, what smart contracts are, um, how this applies to NFTs, and then I'll share some cool links of projects that um, I've seen in the last few weeks to months, some, some of which I've participated in, um, some of which are from um, artists I've, I've worked with or been at residencies with, um, and then perhaps we can do some live coding where we can mess around and with the guts of a smart contract and, and see what it would look like to implement um, some cool features that you all have in mind. So smart contracts um, were an in innovation that makes blockchains programmable. So initially, when we had Bitcoin, um, we have the the network defines some rules. Um, all of the rules on Bitcoin are around um, how new tokens get emitted and how tokens can be spent. So you can almost think like you could almost think of it like a a single smart contract blockchain where all that can happen is new coins come out um, and then people can spend them. They can collect receipts like, you know, if you ever uh, if you ever bring a gift card into a store and then they write your balance on it um, on your receipt and tell you how much money you have left. 
Um, that's like that's basically all that Bitcoin is, um, but in like a big decentralized way that um, allows us to have like a permissionless spending of money. Um, and then there's fees based on network congestion, but those fees aren't really variable based on what you're doing because people are all really doing the same thing. They're just they're sending money from one place to another. Um, on things like Ethereum or Solana or Near or Tezos or um, any of these programmable blockchains, um, they are much, much, much more customizable. So there is still that base layer of um, how do new coins get emitted? How do we secure the network? Um, but anybody can define applications that run on top of them. And that can be either financial applications or it can be artistic, non-financial or coordination, governance. You can you can really write any code that you want to run on it. Um, and the fees on these blockchains are based on network congestion, but also the complexity. And so if you're doing like really complex stuff, um, remember that when you're doing stuff on a blockchain, usually that means that like it has to it has to be replicated on thousands of computers all over the world. And if you're taking up space on a thousand people and a thousand or millions of people's computers, um, your fees are going to go up for that. So that's that's the main difference between another big difference between Bitcoin and then these like smart contract um, blockchains is that it's uh, the the fees can vary depending on how complex uh, of an application you're trying to build. Um, if you tried to build like a um, like a, a database that you would use normally like AWS, like Amazon or Google or Microsoft for, um, it's probably going to be like infeasibly expensive. But you can do some cool stuff uh, nonetheless. So smart contracts can be used for uh, doing things like escrow services, taking an asset and fractionalizing control over it. Um, a classic example that you usually see in uh, in like in programmer in programming interviews, if you want to be a smart contract developer, um, will be to create a notary contract where it takes a document um, and then timestamps it um, and and emits that on chain. Um, but typically, when people are building smart contracts, they're 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 trying to disintermediate somebody. And so, if somebody in the traditional Web two space um, has built a business around as kind of being a central uh, marketplace where they control the data of like who's selling, who's buying um, in a on a blockchain application. Uh, Typically, the goal would be to build something that anybody can have visibility into. And that's why with NFT marketplaces, you can like list something for sale on one, um, but there can actually be like uh, many interfaces around the web where you can find them. Um. <clears throat> So some things are good for uh, are a good fit on smart contracts. Some things are not. Um, like if you're trying to create a uh, um, if you're trying to create some sort of um, like Web two style business, you're probably not going to use a smart contract for all of your business language. So packages get dropped off and my dogs freak out. Um, but smart contracts do have some do have a, a, a fit usually around like whether you're thinking about who owns something, um, what's the provenance of something over time. Um, there's there's things that smart contracts are good at and things that smart contracts um, are are generally not a good fit for. Um, NFTs tend to be a very good fit um, because uh, we're almost creating something out of thin air where things are purely digital. Um, there are lots of cool things you can do with crossing over physical physical world and, and digital. Um, but when something is a purely digital asset, um, then uh, the fact that it can be managed by a smart contract is is good um, because you don't have to maintain some sort of like books in a um, books in like a city hall of who owns what. Um, like the, that's just what the blockchain is really good at doing. Um, decentralizing control is another thing where uh, you can again like everything is possible with smart contracts. You can program in some sort of admin thing where as an artist you can always go in and change an NFT. Um, which, depending on the art that you're creating, might be a cool thing. Like you can update art over time, um, but you can also completely remove your control and allow something that you've created to just go out and exist in space um, without ever having to uh, worry about it again, um, and without the owner having to worry about your like control over it. Um, the third main thing is that we can create a standard interface, which allows for um, a lot of uh, 
a lot of uh, both creativity in um, in how we display these things, but also how we can trade these things. So the main thing about an NFT, no matter what chain is on, um, is that they all conform to some sort of standard interface. That interface is different on Tezos than it is on Ethereum, um, but the point is that when you're creating NFTs, everybody uses some standard interface so that when a new NFT is created, you can recognize it and say, oh, that's an NFT. This is most important for websites that are trying to aggregate information or create like games that involve tokens. Um, but it's it's important to have this like standard interface um, so that uh, everybody can if, like speaking somewhat of the same language. Um, let's kind of pause there for a brief moment if there's any any questions just about kind of like where where smart contracts fit into uh, into blockchains. Cool. So um, the standards are very important because they make marketplaces and exchanges possible. If everybody was rewriting the same code, like um, smart contracts, like under the hood of an NFT, there will be a function called transfer. Um, and like if everybody kind of needs to use the same transfer function or else a marketplace like OpenSea or something wouldn't be able to exist. Um, because everybody who makes a new asset would have to go on and say, okay, well, this is how I define transfer in my smart contract. Um, so you have to like adapt to that. And then it would be this whole manual process of um, submitting like help requests and, okay, please list my new asset. Um, the real innovation of like the ERC 721 standard was to say, okay, we're all going to do some of the same thing, same basic things in the same way so that we can start creating marketplaces and galleries um, without having to like, manually list uh, absolutely everything. So standards evolve over time, though. Um, back in 2017, when people were messing around with uh, CryptoPunks, these were before the ERC-721 standard. So these actually look, if you look on Etherscan or you look some uh, on chain, these more closely resemble a token like USDC, which is like a, a fungible uh, currency, which is like um, uh, tied to a dollar. Um, so these these standards, the, these uh, like crypto funds were before the 721 standard, which meant that like uh, they have their own unique marketplace. If you want to interact with them on other marketplaces, they have to create unique adapters to them. Um, the Dada art community, uh, very only a few weeks after um, the CryptoPunks first came out, uh, created something which was uh, a little bit even more com complex, where they had the concept of multiple editions of the same piece of art. And so these are all like pre-standardization exploration, um, but that's where you see artists pushing the boundaries of what's possible um, before things get standardized and uh, creates the opportunity for the next the next phase of growth. So what actually is a ERC-721 standard? Um, we can look at the, this is a view that you can see on Etherscan if you look at any smart contract. Um, if we go to Etherscan and look for, let's say, let's just grab like uh, a random address. Um, and then we look at the assets and we grab, let's say, um, this, uh, let's see, this like music NFT. Um, we can look at what uh, what the contract, we can look at the code uh, that the contract um, uses to run, and then we can also interact with it in basic ways. Like we can read information about like, okay, who's the owner of this contract? Um, we can see, oh, this contract has an owner. What sort of administrative control do they have? We can look up, let's say like token ID one, what actually is that, uh, what actually is that metadata? So knowing like how to navigate uh, a site like this allows you to start looking under the hood more of how other people's NFTs work uh, and maybe can give you inspiration for how you can um, start uh, creating your own smart contracts. So ERC-20 is only defined uh, like a transfer to um, and value because like typically ERC-20s were used for monetary style coins where I want to transfer 10 USDC tokens to you worth $10. Um, you don't care which USDC tokens you get. And so um, that's all that's defined. Um, when the data community started messing with it more, they, uh, you know, they had... It, it's different whether they're sending you um, 
which print, like which image from the collection. So they introduced like a drawing ID and a print index, which is like, okay, now I'm sending you a specific token that has a specific look to it. Um, and then when ERC721 got standardized, we had this concept of a token ID, which means that like every token in a collection is unique. And so if I look again here at this uh, music NFT contract, if I look at token ID one, token ID two, these are all like, um, these all have a distinct data field, um, which tells us that the, the contents of each one is, can be different. An ERC721 contract is actually not that strict. Um, it defines some basic stuff that you have to comply with, um, which involve the reading information about it. So we have to be able to read the name, uh, a symbol that represents the token, um, the URI, which means like, okay, if I give you a token ID, give me data about it, and we need to know like who the uh, who the owners are. Um, but they also need to be able to uh, be transferred, so like safe transfer from. This function doesn't actually have to work, it just kind of has to be there. Um, and approve, which allows other people to spend your NFTs. And so if we look here, there's, a, there's, there's 21 functions, but I only defined um, like four of them over here that have to be there. And so that means that there's a bunch of stuff here that is customized by this uh, artist for specifically for their project. So if I look at the name, we see that this is called uh, Growing Pains. If I look at the symbol, we can see it's called it's called JMGP, um, and then token URI we were just looking at, um, and we can look at like the owner of various tokens. Um, so that means that this is a compliant smart contract, um, and then we can take the address, go to any marketplace, um, just paste the contract address, and then it just works. Because uh, because it complies with the standard, any marketplace knows how to do it. And this artist didn't did not have to go to OpenSea and specifically say, hey, please list my NFT. Just the fact that it exists and it complies with the standard makes it so that it shows up. So as long as you comply with this basic standard, um, you can do anything else that you want. Um, you can actually mess with the idea of what it means to own uh, an NFT. You can make it so that every time uh, every time it's transferred, the image actually changes so that um, any so that if it transfers from the first person that buys it to the second person, um, the second person gets a unique, a slightly unique thing, which is which is different, um, which potentially is cool. Like there's some audio NFTs that have that simulate degrading audio every time they get transferred as if they're getting written to new tapes. Um, you can have it so that people can change the content on certain days of the week. Um, you can have it so that uh, if you transfer the NFT away, there's some like non-transferable like residue NFT that gets stuck in your wallet forever that you can get never get rid of. Um, you can have NFTs that own other NFTs, um, NFTs that own themselves even. Like you can, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do um, to uh, once you start getting into the guts of like what a what a smart contract is. A few examples um, just from the last few months that I've seen. Uh, this is from an artist named uh, Gordon, who I met in uh, who I met in a couple months ago, um, and he just released this uh, this project of an NFT that it burns every it burns itself every month and it remits itself every month, and therefore it's different every month. Um, so your NFT in January, you can only own for January, and then it do, and then it stops existing, and you have to like renew it in the next month. And then there's some uh, there's some data in the imagery around like what uh, what month it currently is. Um, another project that we have been playing around with is this project um, called uh, <clears throat> called uh, Aminals, like animals but backward, but the and the, and the M are switched. Um, and this is the concept. This is a, a project of a, a concept of a project where NFTs can own themselves, or they can be owned by their position on a grid. Um, and this video is, I guess, not not playing well there. Um, but maybe I can just drag it into the browser and see if that works. Um, but this was an idea of like, what if we had NFTs that didn't have an owner, um, but instead were just these like autonomous beings um, that exist in space? Um, can you all see this? Yeah. So this is this little like creature that's moving around a grid. Um, and the thing that we were playing with here was that each one of these spots on a grid is associated with an address that doesn't actually correspond to a person, but it corresponds to a place. And then um, as the NFT moves around the grid, uh, it 
is owned by its spot on the grid. So it's almost like it's it's not it can never be owned by a specific person. Um, but in this case, we wanted to play with this idea of like, okay, you can feed an NFT, you can make the NFT like you, and then you can have it maybe listen to you, but it can never actually be owned by someone or sit in their wallet or sold. Um, and this is all using the same compliant code. So this would still show up on OpenSea like it's a real thing, but it would basically not be owned by a specific person. So nobody would ever be able to sell it. It's kind of an NFT that owns itself, um, which is just a, a really fun concept. Um, we can also do NFTs that contain other NFTs. So this is a music project I did uh, with some folks from SongCamp where you could buy a pack. And then when you opened this pack in this like animated way, it gave you four random songs from an album. Um, so you can have it so that you can sell one NFT, but then people can like open it trading card style. You can have NFTs that have governance rights. Like um, these are from a project called Public Nouns, which is based on the nouns ecosystem. And in this case, every NFT that gets sold, the proceeds go into a shared treasury that all of the NFTs can then vote on what to spend it on. Um, so this is like the concept of uh, like NFTs that are associated with governance rights and voting um, and changing what it means to have a sale. Like instead of a sale going to a specific person, you can have a sale go to a cause. Um, so there's all sorts of like wacky things you can do um, once you start messing with um, the the actual underlying code and kind of get beyond like the representation of just um, like NFT data uh, image. If you want to start messing around with this stuff, this is my favorite resource, uh, Speed Run Ethereum. Um, it's created by Austin Griffith. He's like a, a amazing supporter of developers in, in the space. And this is a way that you can just kind of go from zero and start learning um, how to program. So these are all apps that uh, are like basically 90% built. And then he has uh, tutorials on how you're going to go in and do the last 10%. And in doing that, you'll learn how to uh, how to at least start writing a little bit of uh, solidity code um, and start messing around with um, start messing around with uh, people's assumptions on, on NFTs. Great. So I'll pause there. Um, any uh, questions or anybody have any like crazy ideas like, hey, can you do this with a smart contract? Because it'd be fun to kind of go through some examples. How long did it take for you to learn how to program uh, contracts? Uh, what's the typical learning curve? Um, so I think it, it, well, it, it highly depends on where you're coming from. So for me, I was uh, I had some programming experience prior to learning Solidity. Um, so um, for me, I was able to kind of dump, jump in, read the docs, and then read the documentation. And then over the course of like a, you know, a weekend or so, I was like, okay, I've, I at least wrote a, a basic smart contract. If you're completely new to programming, um, it'll probably be longer. Like uh, uh, little things can kind of get in your way when you're when you're doing programming where it's like oh now i have to install all this stuff on my computer and often that's like something that will you'll run into roadblocks um uh for like a week or so um, but then once you get through that you know how to get past those roadblocks and then it's like okay cool i changed this line it does this um so the best thing to do is to try to like lower all of those lower all those those hurdles um, and use something either like speedrun ethereum or this thing called remix which is like you can use to just write smart contracts in your browser and that way you're not spending a bunch of time just trying to install stuff on your computer and you can just like change a line and see what breaks um, that's my favorite way to learn programming is you find a program that already works and then you just break it in a bunch of different ways until you figure out okay so that's how it works Thank you. That's a great answer. I'm also curious to know uh, if you've ever designed a contract or a program something and it's flawed in some crucial way that actually breaks the contract, makes it uh, unserviceable or something. Is that possible to do? Uh, yeah, um, that happens very frequently. Um, so let's see. There's some there's some fun examples of how uh, we've leveraged that to uh, kind of create a feature out of a bug. Um, that that it does speak to something where it's like smart contracts are different from programming a, like a website in that you can't just go in and fix bugs like when after something out there in the wild um so i mean i have like endless i probably have like endless examples of like little mistakes i've made that have caused uh, issues um, but one kind of fun one is um in the data uh in the data nft project i wonder if i can find it in the smart contract um 
there is this function. Uh, this was not written by um, me, but this I kind of discovered this bug, and then we had to figure out what to do with it. Uh, make collectible unavailable. Unavailable. Let's see. Okay. So this function. Um, this function looks like any other function, but it actually caused a lot of problems because, uh, wait, where is it? This was supposed to be called after a, a token was sold um, to kind of remove the listing. Um, and it was supposed to only be able to be called by other functions inside the smart contract. Smart contracts have something called an internal function, which other people shouldn't be able to call. Uh, but in this case, um, they forgot a, a they forgot a an internal word here, just like one missing word, and that made it so that um, that the owner could uh, use this function to kind of overwrite some information in the contract. And what this uh, the cause that this had was that it messed with how royalties were calculated. So somebody could go in and they could change the last sale price of their token to make it so that royalties would be calculated wrong or not be paid at all back to the artist. Um, and what the Dada community did instead, instead of saying, ah, oh, this is a bug, we should try to hide this and make sure nobody finds out about it, they actually turned this into a feature, a button on their website that made it so that people could opt in or opt out of royalties. And they basically made the bug accessible so that people could like choose to pay royalties or not. And by sit taking this bug and making it public, um, they were both like uh, removing the possibility of somebody coming in and be like, hey, I found some flaw in your thing. Um, they could say, oh, we know about it. And, like We're using it for, for this thing. Um, that's like kind of a positive, somewhat positive story. There's other bugs where like I've seen website put the address of the NFT in wrong. And then as soon as people go to buy it, um, a bunch of money goes into like a black hole that no one can recover money from because it was like a dead address. Um, those are like worse ones. Um, so yeah, there's those, uh, those are the ones that I'd be worried about. Like making that kind of mistake seems to me fatal. <laughs> yeah, uh, you think fatal, but like um, pe people tend to recover. I mean, in the, in in this space, uh, it's hard to avoid making some like really bad mistakes once in a while. Um, but you know, <laughs> people are pretty forgiving. Um. I'm going to step in here. Um, you had mentioned just earlier that like, you're saying that each NFT smart contract has a certain level of transparency and access to metadata. So, I mean, we just touched on an example where there was a bug, but generally, um, what level of security do most smart contracts contain? I mean, and I ask this because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could hypothetically create an NFT that references or interacts with basically any other NFT on the chain. Uh, so you can, um, but so uh, as far as so for the first question regarding like what what level of security it varies wildly it varies widely. Um, if you're creating, um, there was this project called like Art Gobblers that was created by this like super uh, um, that was created by this group called Paradigm, um, in in collaboration with some some artists. Um, Paradigm are like super professional, like crazy smart programmers. And so they probably had this like audited and paid like hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure that there was no bugs. Um, then there's also like on the other end, uh, I've had projects where just like in a, on a Thursday night, I'm like, oh, this would be a fun project. And I do it and I release it without even like testing the code. Um, so it, it varies wildly. Um, and it kind of depends on just how, um, uh, it's important to be transparent about that to say, hey, I have not tested this. This is an experiment. Uh, be careful. Um, but as far as like what NFTs interacting with other NFTs, the way that like security kind of works in uh, in smart contracts, like other contracts don't have any ability to control your NFTs unless you kind of expressly give them that ability or if you kind of like leave a leave a door open for things to mess with it. Um, if you're using fairly standard smart contracts, you don't uh, at this point, you don't really have to worry about things like uh, ownership breaking where like somebody could come in and transfer an NFT out of your wallet. Um, that's probably not going to be a bug on the smart contract level, um, but there are a lot of examples 
of uh, people doing like phishing scams that get you to accidentally sign something in your wallet, um, which looks like you're doing something else. Um, but what you're actually doing and they're not telling you is like listing your token for sale for zero dollars on OpenSea. Um, so like there's there's different ways that people attack and try to fish um, and it can happen whether in the smart contract or it can kind of happen on the website level. Um, and just to kind of, if you don't mind me taking it a step sure. further, but I mean, artistically, let's say like conceptually, you want an, you want your NFT to just interact with something else that's based on the ERC 721 contract. Um, and it's not necessarily about ownership or affecting that NFT, but it's more about just, um, communicating with it in some way. Yeah, um, you can do that. It de uh, a lot of that depends on where the data is stored for that NFT. And so if we look at the this music NFT um, and we look at the data, um, when we set when we read the token URI, uh, we this actually points to a server that um, it's like julianmud.com. So there would be no uh, because of that, there's no way for your NFT to um, reference like the music or the image inside of your own token um, because this data doesn't exist inside of the smart contract. But if we look at um, another another smart contract like um, let's see, let's look at like these nouns. Um, we look at one of these. This type of NFT, if we look at the token URI, um, in this case, look how massive this is. Uh, all of the data for this image is actually stored on chain. This is an on chain SVG. So if you wanted to make a smart contract that interacted with this in a way where it like took this image of a possum and then yours just like read that image and flipped it upside down um, or stretched it or something like you could do that. Um, so like it depends on where the data is stored, but you can at least do things like create collections of NFTs on chain. You can create like an NFT gallery that owns NFTs and like any NFT would support that. Um, but if you want to like mess around with the actual data, then the data has to be on chain in some way like this. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Can I can I still ask a question? Start sure. Talking? Well, first of all, this is fascinating and so exciting. Thank you for sharing. And um, well, I guess one simple question I had is you mentioned the, the, the app in there to learn the code. I want to make sure I got the name of that. But the other one is, let me see if I can articulate this. Um, well, I guess, first of all, I guess we can also find collaborators that are good at this, right? Uh, to work with us. I mean, I can f imagine myself completely overwhelmed with this, but have ideas. Uh, yeah. Have ideas, have, idea, have good ideas that I want to implement um, that would, I think, would require this. Like, one thing uh, is the idea of having an NFT that uh, within itself, there's an element that now the owners would create a new a new NFT um, is that, uh, and then that all becomes part of the same collection of works. Um, is that something that this kind of coding thing would be uh, applied to figure out with? Yes. Uh, so um, to your first question about like where you find developers, um, the cool thing about the speedrun Ethereum group. Um, is that as soon as you like finish a challenge or something, it gives you an invite to a Telegram group where there's like a few hundred developers that are all um, trying to that are all like looking to do fun projects. And so like this, it, this is not only like a great way to learn how to do smart contracts, but it's also a great way to find new developers that are looking to experiment and, and potentially help out with artists like this community is how I initially found the Dada folks who connect who like are who connect me to all the other folks that I've, I've started collaborating with. Um, so I think that this is like a great group to uh, to become a part of. And, and then that's, to, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. OK, and then yeah, and then the other thing about like um, people that own an NFT getting to create a new one, um, one of these projects that I've been working on um, on and off for a little, little over a year now um, is this uh, project called 
Uh, let's see. Uh, where is this? So this project called Plantoid, which is from um, artist an artist Primavera, um, she creates these like physical sculptures. Um, and each of these physical sculptures is tied to an NFT on chain. Um, and then anybody that like sends money to them gets an NFT, um, which is like a seed. Mm -hmm. And then you can use those to get the rights to create your own like sculpture. And it's almost like a, it's called like a blockchain based life form where mm -hmm. uh, you, like all the people can who support the project can then come together and like collaborate on another project. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, which is like related to the same uh, imagery and stuff. So yeah, you can do all sorts of cool collaborative um, projects uh, using this technology too. That's called, Prima, her name's Primavera? Yeah. Okay. And then the other group is the one that you mentioned earlier, the application to learn code, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's a speed run Ethereum. And then if you like kind of go on there, there should be info on how to join a Telegram group and uh, um, and meet other and meet developers who want to uh, work on fun projects. Okay, and everybody, I mean, I guess it's all trustworthy, or I guess you kind of have to also investigate that. Uh, do people sneak in there that could be trouble? Or, or... Um, it's pretty well moderated. I think okay. that if you're, if you should always, um, whenever you're kind of in these Web3 groups, um, it's better to keep conversation in the main group because that's where like moderators can, can help look out for things. Um, a, a, something that happens often um, is if you're in like a big Discord or a big Telegram, you might start getting like direct messages from people that are that are claiming to be like a moderator or an admin. And then they say, hey, it looks like, hey, I can help you. Just hop on this Zoom call with me, go to this link. And then what they're actually trying to do is like fish you for cryptocurrency. Um, so just typically if you keep things in the main channels um, and then like uh, like cr just double check whenever if, if anybody DMs you, the you should always be skeptical. Um, but uh, generally, these are like well moderated, well, well run groups um, where uh, you can like uh, trust like who who you're talking to. Uh, just be cautious about DMs. Thank you so much. This is really, really helpful and inspiring. Great. Anybody have any weird ideas for what you want an NFT to be able to do? <laughs> um, sorry to jump in. Uh, I, I, I have like so many different ideas for interactive NFTs. And I think um, mostly it's, it's um, the... I think the concept of interactive NFTs sometimes can be confusing for the people who want to collect. And my, like, what is the best way to make these interactive NFTs uh, simple and easy to um, interact with? Because, I, for example, I, I was experimenting with this concept that... Um, if a person buys an NFT from uh, from uh, this specific collection and they get to uh, create a new one, but there's like uh, several steps that they have to go through. But um, everybody wanted to keep the, that first NFT that they bought. <laughs> so I feel like it's a bit um, hard to to get people to, to go through those steps. And mm -hmm. I want to know what, what is the best way to get people to interact with, with your NFT, but easier and uh, simpler way um, to do it. And mostly I interacted with, uh, with Manifold, so I don't really know how to do other like coding and stuff. Uh, maybe that I should try those as well, but that that's the road I took so far. So, mm. but I would love to know your uh, input. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah, um, I think that um, yeah, creating the actual like, well, there, there's a couple steps there. One is like ed educating people on what they can do with that, which is like just you know, com like building the community, building interactions with them, and um, like one uh, another an example of a project that. Um, I helped create a couple weeks ago is this, uh, let's see, um, is this music NFT project, 
um, on the sound protocol where people could mint uh, where people could mint these songs, um, but then they could take an interaction to like uh, they could like burn four of their songs to get like an additional one. And so in that case, we had like a telegram group with like a few hundred collectors who were buying who were like buying the pieces. Um, and then the artist announced like, hey, now here's this like additional feature you can do to like uh, burn the tokens and get and get like a new one. And that was a uh, it's actually quite a lot of work. Um, Because like I had to build that functionality into the smart contract, and then I had to find a front end developer who was like good at who was like um, uh, making like good really good at making these like interactive websites. Um, So it's a collaborative effort. There's no kind of like easy answer to making a interactive artwork. Um, You just kind of have to uh, rally. Uh, people like do some project management, um, figure out how to like uh, like yeah organize this group and then and then ship it together. Because it's, it's a lot of skill sets that come together in order to do um, these like interactive uh, interactive projects. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, I, I I am in another like community that we do a lot of interactive stuff, but we have like a, a dev for for those kind of projects. But for my own, because my project was super small, <laughs> mm-hmm. so uh, like I feel like for like a very small uh, project, it's uh, it's a bit. Uh, hard to bring all this team together <laughs> <laughs> but yeah this was very interesting and I'm real I'm uh, into exploring uh, this uh, this route with uh, interactive nfts and I love it great this yeah is, I think, this is something that I think is uh, a bit missing maybe in uh, photography community and I haven't seen and seen that much of interaction there so I'm exploring that and this is very helpful thank you yeah I think that'd be uh, great to explore more one more quick question or like actually to uh, can an NFT or a smart contract own itself or and can it have no owner uh, yes, they can. Um, so um, the a valid address for an owner um, is just like any uh, any any address. And like in in Ethereum, there's no distinction between uh, smart contract addresses and like wallet addresses. The 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 blockchain treats them identically. Um, so you could have a con you could have an NFT which is which on OpenSea shows up as like owning itself. It would the would the owner would say like the same address as the smart contract. Um, but then you could have like your own like I don't know secret functions that people could go in and and mess around with it. Like hey, let's all vote to see who owns this NFT next. Um, so yeah, you can uh, you can uh, you can mess with that. And if you have no owner, um, you have to, I think you have to have like an owner field, um, but you could have it always return zero, which basically means that it's like, it like doesn't exist. Um, Some marketplaces would not know how to deal with that. Like they would think that it was, if it's owned by an address of zero, most marketplaces assume that that means that it's been destroyed, Um, but you can make it be owned by um, like, there's all these like vanity addresses which don't actually correspond to a uh to a real address um like if we look at uh, let's see my sharing yeah if we look at uh, the address uh let's see there's an address just called like dead um let me find let me just find what that actual full address is Where is that? So this is the zero address that you can look up on Ethereum, which nobody could ever. Uh, let's see if it goes to it. So if if imagine that if you figured out what the key was to the zero address, you would have like like seventeen million dollars of of ether and like one hundred ninety three like billion dollars of coins, but you wouldn't because like everything that is owned by this address is assumed to be um, destroyed. So um, there's also addresses like 
zero 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 and then d e a d which is like a, again like a valid address um but nobody could really ever figure out the key to this address just based on like how the blockchain works because like if you figured out the key to the debt address oh cool there's another 20 million dollars for you um and then 400 and then 500 million dollars worth of other tokens and so there's all sorts of these addresses that um like uh beef is a valid address um but like no one owns beef uh so like uh, somebody sent a cow token to beef address because like it's just kind of like a joke um so you can like mess around with these like unavailable addresses um to also like mess uh, uh play around with some things i wonder who sent cow tokens to the beef address it's kind of funny crypto cow actually another good lesson don't ever just click on random links on either scan because a lot of them are also um somebody might have done this to try to get you to click on cryptocow.app um actually i'll click on it and see if this is a phishing scam that would be kind of um yeah so it's trying to connect to my wallet so let's i'll give you a quick like live demo of a phishing scam possibly you have no cows these three cows are for previewing all right so this so far so far this does not look exactly like a phishing scam but then now that I've connected my wallet to this random website that I found on Etherscan, I wouldn't be surprised if I left this window up, like if in a minute, it just randomly popped something up onto my MetaMask that was like, hey, can we can we spend all of your NFTs? Or hey, would you like to send us all the money in your wallet? Um, like that's probably something that would happen if I kept this website open. So I'm going to disconnect and close it. Um, yeah. I was just going to add, um, hey, everybody, um, that uh, I'm definitely going to have to dress up uh, as the Grim Reaper in a performance and, and send it to the dead address. That's a definite. <laughs> I love performative NFTs. Cool. Any other uh, wacky ideas? Always feel free to like message me with, hey, is it possible for an NFT to do blank? Because, um, yeah, that's the main thing that I'd love to see is just more more people just like messing around with like the internal guts of NFTs um, and uh, change the conversation from just like trading and ownership and floor prices to like, you know, art. You're one of you're one of our mentors, right, Isaac? We can reach out to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that you should. I'm not sure if I uh, what my official status is, but feel free to DM me, um, or just put like ping me in channels. And if I don't respond, ping me again, just because I have like too many notifications. Great. I think it's possible to uh, design a, an NFT with a contract that would uh, permit the NFT to be burned and then subsequently resurrect itself, actually return into circulation after it's been. Um, um, sent off to a, a dead address. Uh, yes. So I'll, let me send a link to the project from Gordon because I, I haven't looked at the code from his project, but I have. I suspect that it's somewhat um, similar to that, where basically at the end of the month, the January NFT can be burned and go to the dead address, and then on February first, it can kind of come back from the dead address and become the February NFT. And so uh, it sounded uh, like that was uh, being reminted, though it was simply being recreated uh, from scratch uh, in each new iteration. I'm curious to know if the same uh, NFT, if the same uh, metadata, all of the same features of it, would actually once placed in a, a the the dead address uh, be subsequently resurrectable. It would actually be able to, uh, I don't know, come come back like a phoenix, you know, uh, f uh, after it had been subsequently burned. Yes, you could make like a phoenix NFT that, like, let's say, like six months after it's burned, it becomes possible to be reminted again. And you could have it be like a race to like re remint that thing. Um, what's funny is like marketplaces don't they uh, when an NFT is minted, it looks like it uh, on a on chain. It looks like it's getting transferred from the zero address to a non zero address. Um, so the first time it's born, it's kind of coming back. It's kind of coming from the dead address. Um, and then when it dies, it's like going to the dead address. And then you could have it kind of go back and forth and back and forth if you want to. Um, OpenSea might break, but that's also kind of funny. Um, to but, So yes, you can do that. That's a very curious thing. I, I, but I, I guess what I'm, uh, I was asking is, is, is it still the same NFT or is it simply a, a simulation of it, a copy of it or some uh, fabrication all, of it? It's in your mind. There's a... 
uh, it's all it's all made up anyway. So like it's yes, it's the same NFT, and yes, it's a copy. Um, it would show up as the same NFT. I think on marketplaces, if it had if it had the same token ID and it came from the same contract, um, but uh, it's all like uh, yeah, it would have the same address, the same ID, and so for for our definition of what is an NFT, yes, it's the same token, um, but uh, again, like it's all just it's all made up anyway. Edifying. That's great. Really helpful. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Isaac, I've got another question, um, mm -hmm. and this is about the referencing again. So I've seen some NFTs, actually a number of them in the past, reference more global on-chain data, like, say, for instance, the fluctuating price of ETH. Um, so, you know, I, I know this information is transparent on Etherscan, but it doesn't seem like it's associated with a unique token ID or an address. So how are people tapping into this kind of larger dynamic information? Um, like they have like the price of ETH uh, like contained inside of the image and stuff. Or, uh, right. Or the let's say it's a generative image or a generative artwork that pulls on the price of ETH at the moment that it's minted. Something like that. Yeah. Um, let me grab. Let's see. Uh, oh, I'm sharing. Am I just sharing Discord? There we go. Um, so there was an NFT uh, also created by uh, Austin called Bernie Boys because he just does all these like fun projects to show off like what's possible. Um, I'll show. I'll send the contract address for this. This was a project that when um, when a when an upgrade to the Ethereum network came out which made it so that um, fees were burned instead of given to the miners. Um, then he created this collection where inside of your NFT, it contains what the gas price was at the moment that it minted and your token ID. Um, so if we look at, and I'll uh, so post a link to this. So we can actually dig into the code to see how it's fetching that data. Um, so if we go to Etherscan, and contract um, code. So let's look for where that's coming from. Um, this is burn NFT. So I would start looking here. Um, and let's see, mint. OK, so we can like read the logic of the mint function. And uh, so first, it's checking to make sure that you've paid enough money for it, like it wanted you to buy it. Um, it incremented the number of NFTs. Um, and then let's see, um, token base fee. So then it grabbed the data from on chain. So in this case, the, the gas fee is readable just directly on chain where it says block dot base fee and it saved that. Um, if you want the price of ether, you're probably going to have to ask like an Oracle, like asking, uh, another, like a, a contract, um, from Uniswap or something where you can query it and say, hey, what is the price of Ether at this exact moment? Um, so if that data is available on chain, your smart contract can read from that contract. In this case, it's just reading it directly from data that's globally available on chain. Um, and then if we look at the token URI, um, it ha he has this uh, function called metadata generator. Let's look for that. So inside of metadata generator, um, now you can see he has all of this like SVG boilerplate. Um, and so this is like the, uh, and then he just like combines all these SVGs together and adds in the fee um, to the point inside the SVG where it would get rendered. And so this is how it can like pull data on chain and then just kind of get concatenated or um, added together with other strings so that it can actually form the, uh, the image that gets rendered on marketplaces. And so it's like a combination of putting boilerplate in your code um, and then calling another contract to grab the data um, and then using that inside of the token URI function. Rad. Super awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One quick question related to this. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the price of storing large amounts of code on blockchain inside of the smart contract? Like I'm assuming if that SVG had been huge, it wouldn't have been feasible to do it inside of the contract and it would have had to do it off chain, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I used to have like kind of a rule of thumb, but like it, it kind of changes with, with prices and stuff. But um, so if you were, I guess a, a good estimate is so the maximum amount of gas you can spend in a block um, is like 30, 30 million gas. 
Um, I think that's I think that's the case. And uh, it's possible that like there's that you can do more than that with some of the recent upgrades. Um, but let's just take that as an example of like if you were to deploy a smart contract that used up all of the gas inside of in, inside of one block on the blockchain, um, it would be like 30, uh, 30 million gas. And that would cost. Uh, let's imagine. Let's look at the current price of gas. Its current price of gas is forty six uh g way so four six e minus nine and eth is currently worth fifteen hundred dollars and so it, it would right today it would cost you two thousand dollars to use up all of the um to use up all of the gas in one block um and uh as an example um i'm working on this uh project where i'm trying to store i'm trying to like generate svgs um of like signatures and uh movement scores like choreography on chain and just these two signatures um which are svgs um were about eight million gas and so we're trying to currently figure out how to optimize it because just uh a smart because just these two use up about 20 percent of the entire gas of a block and so it would be like wait really really expensive and so uh it like it quickly gets expensive unless you're doing like really basic stuff. That's why like loot NFTs were so uh, popular because like this is actually this is while this is an SVG and all sort on chain, um, it's very little data. Um, it's really just like words. But yeah, general rule of thumb today, if you were to try to use up the entire gas of a block, it's about two thousand dollars. Cool. Thank you. as a reference a normal nft contract um today would probably cost about 10 or 20 dollars to deploy and so it really does expand the space if you're trying to put on-chain data but it's cooler there's other libraries that people are coming out with to make it so that they've deployed a lot of boilerplate and then you can just reference the same stuff uh, over and over again uh, i need to figure out what the i need to remember what the link was to that um it was like Scribble or something like that. Um, but given that other people are uh, are creating these libraries, it can it can greatly like reduce the cost if you uh, use some existing libraries that are already on chain. I wish I saved it. Why didn't I bookmark that? I'll look for it. Okay. Any other questions about smart contracts? Wow. Wonderful. Well, uh, if there are no no other questions at this time, we can call it a class. Any last questions? Excellent. Thank you so much, Isaac. This was really, really helpful. You're welcome. Thanks for thanks for the opportunity to come today. And uh, again, feel free to um, feel free to ping me with any wacky NFT ideas. Thank you so much. This was so inspiring. Great. Thanks all. Oh, I do have one last question, Isaac. Um, do you have a Twitter handle? I do. Let me find that. Um, so I can follow you. <laughs> that's me. And while you get that, you said that the way to reach you is through Discord, to, uh, or can we reach you to Twitter as well? Uh, Twitter DMs work. It's also at, on Telegram. Telegram is probably the best for me. Um, and then probably Twitter second and then Discord third. Okay. Thank you. I might reach out as well for <laughs> ideas.
Great. Yeah, and if any of you are looking for like uh, to join that kind of speedrun community to look for devs to collaborate with, I can also um, you know help send links and stuff. Also, do you collaborate too? I do. I'm usually pretty. I'm usually pretty like super busy. Uh, uh, feel free to send me ideas um, that you're working on, and I might I might know some other devs that that would be a good fit. Um, yeah, right now my main projects. Uh, well, I have kind of this web three security project that is like my main thing and then um i i just finished a couple of music nft projects um and then i'm um, working on this like uh generative choreography project with some other artists um, which is like taking up all my time right now um yeah. and then uh might do some other stuff in the spring sounds great okay so were you gonna give us your twitter handle Did uh yep it's in the chat Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.